If you could open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, we're going to continue our series this morning in this book, in chapter 4. And as I've done often in preaching through this book, I'm, I'm going to read the, the entirety of the section. We're, we're only going to look at three verses, but because it's a part of a larger section, I, I want those three verses to be seen in their, in their context for what they're doing in the paragraph that we find them in. So let's read, uh, reread the first three verses of chapter 4, and then we're going to look at the second three uh, this morning in more detail. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. If you wanted a title for this message, I would title it One Together. One Together. Isn't that the emphasis of these next three verses, verses four through six, that there is one unity, one connection, one togetherness that has taken place called the church. And it is not a unity of mere preference or a superficial unity. It's, it's, it's a unity built on uh, singularities, treasures of which there is only one, that every Christian shares together, that there is a, a unity, a, a bonding that has happened around key principles of the Christian life. That's what this passage is doing. It's motivating us to treasure the unity that God has given his church, to treasure that unity. That's what Paul is about, to treasure it, not to trade it for the temporary, for the convenient, but to trade treasure for trinkets. That's what Paul is trying to get the church to see. I, I remember when I was a teenager, some age, 12, 13, something like that, I remember a, a basketball game out in front of my house, and my little brother was there a number of years younger than me, and I don't remember all the details of what happened in the game, but I do remember very clearly feeling crushed and convicted afterwards. I remember going to my room and just lying there for a while. And eventually, feeling tears begin to form in my eyes and realizing that I had failed in a very significant way. I don't remember the details of all that happened, but somehow my little brother had been the object of some sort of teasing or ostracism, or maybe he wasn't good enough to be included in the game in some way. And, and, and rather than include him and stand up for him as my brother or be with him in some way, I, I had not. I had stood at a distance. And I remember it striking me later that I had, I had traded something priceless, a, a union that was priceless. I was close to my little brother. I remember that in that moment, I had traded that priceless union for something temporary, maybe my reputation or the chance to be with the big guys or have a, a big guy game or, or something so, so trivial in comparison. I traded a treasure for the trivial. I think Paul, in walking through this passage on the heels of an appeal that the church maintain the unity that the Holy Spirit has created, that they love each other, that they care for each other, that they, they remain connected, that they remain humble towards each other, he's, he's essentially discerning the same temptation. He's discerning 
the fragmenting forces that are at work in our own hearts and in this fallen world that draw Christian brothers and sisters away from each other. And he wants to remind them of the value of the unity that God has created, how priceless this treasure is that we are one together. Maybe you can relate to my brother in that basketball moment. Maybe you have experienced a Christian distancing themselves from you or harming you in some way. Or maybe you can relate to me. Maybe there's been some moment where you have harmed or wounded or distanced yourself from a brother or sister in Christ. Maybe you can relate to those fragmenting forces. Let me ask you some questions. What do we do when the person you have considered a close friend suddenly makes it very clear that they are disappointed in you? What do you do when the friend to whom you divulged a secret has shared it with someone else? What do you do when the person with whom you serve treated you harshly? What do you do when the person to whom you gave your best apology has remained at a distance from you, unwilling to reconcile? What do you do when the friends you've reached out to countless times haven't invited you over in a year? What do you do when you have a deep desire for something in your life, maybe a godly marriage or children or financial security, and it seems like people are constantly insensitive in discussing those very issues around you? What do you do in those moments? You struggle to exercise, and they're constantly talking about their exercise routine. You struggle at work, and they're constantly talking about how great work is going. Perhaps other Christians have dismissed your dreams or goals as unreasonable or unusual or legalistic. Perhaps other Christians have called your attempts toward holiness strict and harsh, or perhaps you felt condescension in choices that you've made. Maybe people always seem to make light of an issue that's very important to you. Maybe you've been on the receiving end of a harsh criticism or a, a harsh correction and you've never received an apology. Maybe you realize that you disagree with a close friend about a political candidate or a schooling choice for your children or a standard in movies or how long could the list be? fragmenting forces at work in a fallen world. We all know them to be true. It's, it struck me as a pastor uh, how often it's the case when you comment uh, somewhat sarcastically about tension in the church, uh, often a church will chuckle because knowingly they know, oh yeah, I've seen that before. I know that can happen. And yet when the moment comes and that pain and tension comes home, it's not a chuckling matter at all. It's a painful matter. It's not easy. It's hard. And there's this fragmenting force, this sense of being drawn away, drawn apart. It's as though something in our heart and something away from this Christian is at work at the same time. There's a fragmenting force. What do we do? What do we think about? How do we counteract the fragmenting force? What do we turn on in our meditation so that we feel a force in the opposite direction? Because we need help, don't we? If you've ever been in a conflict, a real conflict, not the little wimpy conflicts where they said they were sorry and you didn't even know something was wrong, not those kind of conflicts, the conflicts where you were really truly hurt by something someone did and you don't want to be close to them anymore and they don't want to be close to you anymore. What do you do then? What do you do then when that fragmenting force is pulling your heart. And the last thing you want to do is draw close to this person and be in unity again. What do you do? What do you meditate on? How, we might ask Paul, 
maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. How, Paul? You got to give me something to turn on in my brain because when my brain encounters that person, I don't feel one. I feel run. I don't want to be close to them. I want to be far from them. Turn something on, Paul. Help me to see what's true. Turn the truth on in my heart. I remember one point, one of my children had to have an MRI done. And I, I never had an MRI done. I, I didn't know how they worked, but um, they were very, very, very stern when we came into the office about take anything metal out of your pocket, anything. Now, I tried to be compliant, but I'd never been in there, and clearly I wasn't concerned enough. So somehow we missed something. I think she had a, a little hair clip in or something that was you know, metallic at some level, and I'd missed it. I, I had missed it. And uh, despite all the warnings and the danger and the death is a possibility here, I, somehow I'm an idiot and I missed it. And I'm, here I am and I brought her in and then they turned that thing on and man, something flew across the room and ran into that. And there was this clink sound. And I suddenly realized, well, they're serious. This is powerful. This is a powerful thing because it's a big magnet in there and ask somebody else other than me how that works but somehow they turn it on and the magnet just draws any metallic thing and it just hits that machine and, and so forth right this passage should function like a giant MRI machine drawing our heart to other Christians it should function as more powerful than any fragmenting force, any little, little wimpy, sinful magnet. In comparison to this, our fragmenting forces of our own pride and our own selfishness and the forces in this world and the sins of others, they should be as though I brought into that room a, a, a little wimpy horseshoe magnet. And I was just going to try to hold on to something. In comparison to this... The fragmenting forces should be minimized, should be worthless because of the power at work in what Paul is describing. These seven facets, he, he walks through seven facets of unity. Now, now, we have unity with other Christians because of what we share. And I think what Paul would say is this, what you share with other Christians is the most important thing about you. What you share with other Christians is the most important thing about you. There is nothing more important about me than what I share with you. Nothing more important. And he makes it seven times clear. He looks at seven facets. I don't think these are, these are different diamonds. That's not a helpful way to view it. it. Really, this is one diamond, and he's looking at one facet after another and saying, there is nothing more valuable about you than what you have in common with other Christians. And when you turn on that truth in your soul, it is a magnet that will fight against the fragmenting forces that are inevitable in a sinful group of people trying to live life together. So let's turn it on. Let's look at these seven facets one at a time. Obviously, we won't have time to look at anyone in any detail, but I think the point is the cumulative effect that Paul is just <laughs> generating in our heart as we walk through them. Let's, let's look at these. First of all, Paul says, in this passage, that, that we're to maintain the unity, that's, that's sort of the exhortation that flows in uh, to this study of what unity we have. And he begins to list them. And there's an abruptness in the original Greek. There's an abrupt launch of these phrases. One, 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 Paul says over and over again. He begins by saying, there is one body. There is one body. Now, a couple of caveats. Obviously, Paul planted many churches. He doesn't mean there's one congregation. He means there's only one body of Christ. The, the, the true people of God that have been saved by the Spirit, rescued by Jesus Christ, there is only one body of Christ. Jesus isn't the head of, of, of multiple different kinds of organizations. He's the head of, of one church, and a true congregation is a local expression of that church. Commentators believe that's the right way to view it. It's not as though each church is, is, a, is a part of the body, though one sense that's true. But a better way to think about it is each church is a, each true church is an expression, a, a tangible expression of what the body is. There is one body. Now, this should humble us, I think. 
Because when it relates to other churches, um, we should not consider ourselves the only body if they are true believers and truly believe the scriptures and the gospel, we shouldn't condescend to them. But it certainly means that when we're relating to another Christian, and particularly in our own body, in our own church, there should be a reminder that's penetrating, that's turned on in our brain. Th this person is a part of the same body. That's why the metaphor is so helpful. You can imagine a hand desiring to be distant from a wrist never going to happen. You can imagine a, a nose wishing space from the eye. Not going to happen. You can imagine a foot wishing space from the ankle. No, no, no. There is one body, and the body belongs to Jesus Christ. And so you can feel the force of that magnet. Therefore, uh, no, no, no you, you can't actually be distant. And here's one of the, the key points that needs to be made about this. The unity that we have is permanent and unchangeable. It can be devalued. It can be resisted. But it cannot actually be taken away. Christians are in one body. It's a fact. You are in one body. You are. You are in one body with a fellow Christian. You are a finger to their hand. You are a foot to their ankle. You are an elbow to their wrist. You are in one body. You are, Paul says, there is only one body. Not two, not a million. There's one. And therefore, you should feel the reality that the most important thing about you, and Paul's been describing it for three chapters now, you've been brought in to the body of those saved by the grace of God that is the most important thing about you, and that is the thing you share, I share, with other Christians. In the one body. When Christians despise the body of Christ, they act like the world, which crucified his physical body on that cross. Treasure, Paul would say. Treasure the unity. Don't devalue what is most important to you. What is most important to Paul, he shares in common with every other Christian. What is most important about me and you, I share in common with you. So that pulls us together. One body, Paul says. Second facet of the diamond, he turns it. Remember the one spirit. There is only one spirit. Not one individually for each Christian. Not a part of the Holy Spirit for Joe and a part for Sally. And he functions this way because that's what the spirit that he lives with does. And she functions this way because that's the spirit what he, she, he lives with does. No, no, Paul says that the same spirit is at work in both of you. You were both regenerated by the same spirit, indwelt by the same spirit. So if we can imagine it this way, the same spirit is at work in two Christians who are seeking to live in isolation from each other. Stretching the spirit is not a good idea. I mean, if we can imagine, it breaks our physical understanding, but this is true. It's true spiritually. The same Holy Spirit indwells you and your sister in Christ. The same spirit. And trust me, he's more connected to himself than you are disconnected from her. So when there is this fragmenting force, bitterness, disappointment, disillusion, selfishness, anger, whatever it is, gossip, that's pulling, re remember the bond that links. It's the same spirit inside. This, this sister that I'm talking to, she's indwelt by the same spirit that's inside of me, not a different spirit. It's not as though we have individual Christians in their own individualistic ways trying to serve upward towards God. No, Paul says, the same spirit has indwelt each Christian and is drawing them all towards God and therefore towards each other. Turn on that magnet. Fight those fragmenting forces. When I'm talking to a Christian brother, the same Holy Spirit is fighting his flesh that's fighting mine. Remember the one spirit, Paul says. Remember the one hope, Paul says. Remember the one hope, just as or even as he chose us, I'm sorry, even as um, 
Sorry, I lost my place. My page keeps turning. Uh, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. So he's saying in the same way that you have one spirit, in that same way, you were called to the same hope. And I think in Paul here, hope refers to the thing that we're hoping for. It's the possession that we have in the future. So we're headed to the exact same future, future of being in the presence of God. The inheritance of the Christian is the same. So let's think about the kind of fragmenting force that is at work uh, when our plans are disrupted. Well, but our most important future plans are precisely the same. We are heading to exactly the same destination, filled with the same joy and longing and desire and the same confidence that God will provide it for us. This is our future. Our future is shared. We are one in our future. What, what future do you have with another Christian? Exactly the same that they have. Exactly the same. No different. We don't have individualistic futures. We, we have one future that we share. The most important things about me I have in common with you. Now, we, we know that there are differences among Christians, difference in gifting, difference in background, difference in sin tendency. One person is angry and silent. The other person is angry and loud. One person likes hospitality. The other person likes study. There's different giftings in Christians, but the things we have in common are much more important than the things we have in distinction. The one hope that we have towards heaven and towards seeing the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, that desire and hope that fills and empowers every Christian, they share with every other Christian. Have you ever had that experience where you suddenly realize that something you really love is something that a friend really loves too? And, and it just has this marvelous sense of, I didn't know that about you. Wow. It could be a certain kind of food or maybe you've been to the same location. I can't believe you've been there too. There's this sense of commonality and this, this unifying force. And the closer that issue is to our heart, the more the effect it has on us. Now, Paul is assuming that Christians' most dear, most treasured values are being listed here. The one hope. And he's informing them, you have the same hope. I don't know if you've met Sally. Uh, she is hoping for the same heaven you are. And the effect on a Christian should be, wow, I didn't, that's great. We're going the same place. The effect is to minimize the less significant differences. Turn on the magnet of our oneness in the gospel. Treasure the unity we've been given. Remember the one hope. Remember the one Lord, Paul says. It, it just keeps, it's almost as though it accelerates, it increases. Remember the one Lord. We have the same Lord, Paul says. Maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You have one body. You have one Spirit. You have one hope. And Paul, as he always is, is very Trinitarian. You notice in this passage, not only seven facets of a diamond, but a progression through the three members of the Trinity. The Spirit, and what he's created in the body of the church, and the hope that he is the member of chapter one, he is the marker of that guarantee, the Spirit, and now he moves on to the second member of the Trinity, the one Lord, and he's not going to talk about the one faith that we have in that Lord, the confidence that we have in him through his gospel, and the baptism in which we are united to him in his death and resurrection, see, second member of the Trinity, and then he ends, the Father who is over all and through all, and he's just working through the Trinity. So underlying the seven facets is this overwhelming truth, guess who is the ultimate model of diversity that is grounded in unity. The Trinity itself, God exists in a plurality that is unified. God is three persons and one God. So underlying the, the seven facets, they're not just like seven individual categories. Really, the underlying truth of all of that is what do you share? God, the Trinitarian God, that's what you share. 
Now he moves to the second person, the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you believer, you have the same Lord, the same Lord. You bow to the same God. When you draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ, your brother or sister, they draw near to that same Lord Jesus Christ too. They love him. They have submitted their life to him. They want to honor him too. If your heart is enraptured by glorifying him, there's someone else that is an absolute ally in that pursuit. If his kingship is most important to you and you desire most to see his name seen in the heavens and the earth and his praise resounded, there's someone else that shares that passion right along with you. Now, you don't share this with unbelievers because they tolerate him at best and hate him at worst. You might share a love of hunting with an unbeliever, or maybe you like arcade games, or maybe you like pinochle, but you don't share the most important thing, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you share with other Christians. Here's where a conviction should and can set in. If these principles that you actually share, we, I, actually share with other Christians, if they don't create the magnet in the heart, it's not because they aren't powerful to do that. It's that we have devalued these principles in our own life. These should be the most important things. If another kind of unity has a greater effect on you than being in, in obedient followership of the one Lord, the, the problem is this other issue has begun to shroud the importance of the Lord in my life. Now, I, I know that in my own heart, and I'm sure you do as well. You find someone who is excited about a, a movie that you love, and there's this burst of, wow, I, I'm with you in that. Or maybe they're for your same sports team, or they like your same hobby, or they're interested in the same kind of novel you like, or they have a background in the same work experience you do. And there's this burst of unifying power that comes to your heart. Yes, I love that too, and therefore I love you. And Paul says, well, that's fine, but the greatest effect of unity should be accomplished by the greatest principle, the greatest value that's in your soul. And surely the Lord Jesus Christ is the most important thing to you. And surely finding someone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ connects you to them. You are a kindred spirit with them more than anything else. So this passage works in both ways. It, it convicts us when other aspects of our life have become too important to us. And we start to be drawn our values drive our unity. It's another way you could put this passage. We're unified to the people and the things we value the most. So if we value a certain personality style the most, we're most drawn to that person. If we value a, a certain way of raising children the most, then we're drawn to that kind of person. If we're, we value a, a certain freedom and certain principles of the Christian life, we're drawn to that kind of person. So the question we should ask is, are we drawn most to the people who share the most important things with us? Or have other things started to increase in value to us so that we're actually drawn most to those things. I, I know Christians who are blunt relationally and Christians reticent relationally. I know Christians who love uh, having tons of people at their house and people for whom that is an overwhelming burden. I know Christians who love uh, practical administration and Christians who love relational connectivity. I know Christians who love evangelism and Christians who love discipleship and Christians who love worship and Christians who like worship to be shorter and so they can hear more preaching. I, I know Christians and you know Christians who like all kinds of different things. The question is, do we feel unified to the most important things, or are we occasionally drawn to lesser trinkets, trivial, lesser treasures than the most important values? There is no greater value that I have than being a, a person under the allegiance of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you tell me that, 
He's my Lord. I'm not going to sweat the other stuff because it's less significant to me. Remember the one Lord. We sit at the feet of the same Savior. Remember the one faith, Paul says. The one faith. This could be the fact that Christians have to exercise faith and it's not by works. I think more likely um, it is that the content of our, our beliefs, the content of our truth, the one faith, as we might describe it, the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that faith that is placed on his substitutionary person and work on the cross, the fact that we believe that his death paid for our sins, the fact that we believe that he died in my place on that tree, the fact that we believe that the wrath of God once poised over me has been washed away in him, and now I stand under his grace. I have this in common with you. If you're a Christian, I have this in common with you. You have knelt at the foot of that tree. You have seen by faith the Savior bleeding in your place and offering his last gasp to die for you. You have seen him by faith rising from that tomb and ascending to glory. And this one faith I share in common with you. The most important thing about you is the most important thing about me. We've been to the cross. Now let's remember some of those moments. The sister who abruptly broke off what had been a delightful friendship. The, the, the brother who just seems to constantly belittle you. And he said he's trying to grow, but he just hasn't made a lot of progress yet. Or this person who loves baseball, and you think it's the most boring athletic endeavor in the world. Or this person who can't stop talking about what they're accomplishing at work, and you'd rather go fishing. Or this person who is constantly uh, uh, talking about some interest they have in their life that you could care less about. Or the person who teases you about an area that's very sensitive to you. The person who doesn't notice when you're lonely. And here they come, walking toward you at church. That situation comes to mind in the week as you're planning a hospitality. Here they come walking into care group. Now, we all know how to put on the nice American Christian face and greet them with a hug and a smile. But I'm talking about the heart level now. Most of the time, in most reasonably mature churches, you don't have cat fights in care group, okay? Most of the time, that doesn't happen. You know, scratching and clawing and Bible throwing. That doesn't normally, normally happen. However, at the heart level, sometimes this magnet is not switched on. And it must be. They. This annoying, tempting, selfish, gossipy, Christian, and they are that way, has been to the cross. They share the one faith with me. Is their current state of sin, their current troublesomeness, more important to me than the cross that we share? What drives me more? Don't trade the trivial for the treasure. The one faith, one baptism, Paul says. Baptism, I think he's talking about baptism as it is symbolic. We've all participated in this same symbolic act. If you're a Christian, where you went under the water and you came out of the water. And the point Paul's making is we've all shared this same baptism and what it signifies. We were dead and we've been made alive again in Christ. We are resurrected former dead sinners having a party together called church. That's what Paul's saying. And in that party, trivial things really shouldn't drive our unity nearly so much as the same narrative we share. 
Imagine if you could a ridiculous scenario where you had two people lost in a shipwreck, both drowning, that are rescued by a Coast Guard. And there they sit huddled in the Coast Guard, heading towards shore and life and safety. And one notices that the other has a bit more blanket than he does and begins to argue and bicker. Give me more. You're taking too much of the seat. Why did you get the warmer coffee? Why did you say that like that? Why are you always so snipey at me? Why can't you wear your hat forward? Why are you always so bothersome this time in the morning? And imagine the captain of the vessel comes over and says, what is wrong with you? <laughs> you were just dead and you're alive. You were lost and you're found. Why are you bickering about trivial things? Yes, but he always takes too much of the seat. There's a line and he crosses it. You were dead. He was dead. You're both alive. Quick caveat, of course I'm not saying that sin isn't painful and that conflict doesn't need to be resolved and that we don't go if we've offended them or if they've offended us or if we think that they're offended with us. Of course we do. We go and we apply the gospel and we seek God and it's really, really hard and we try to love the unlovely and the unloving. But... These principles are the place to start. I wouldn't start in reconciliation by the duty. I would start with the unity. What do we have in common with this person that has annoyed me so much right now? This blanket they keep taking in, this chair they keep taking in, this way they treat me and the way they talk to me. Let's start by the fact that we were both dead. We are the company of the resurrected. It doesn't change it. you got to have a conversation still. But wow, it changes the perspective. Remember the one baptism we share. Remember the one Father. The one Father. Paul says there's one Father. One Father who is over all and through all, and in all, the one God who has become our Father, over all, through all, in all. He moves to the third member of the Trinity, the one who has adopted us into his family, the one who has claimed us as his children, the one who is supreme over all, which is to say he is the most glorious, the most important part of our story anyway. And he's working through all, which means every, every brother or sister in Christ is sent by the Father to accomplish his purpose. We're a child going towards the same task in obedience to the same Father. And he's in all, meaning by his Spirit, the Father that hears my prayer is the Father that hears his prayer, her prayer. Remember, because of the indwelling Spirit, the Trinity, through the Spirit, is present simultaneously in every Christian. So we've got to break through our space limitations here. God is not present in order. First I listen to Sally, then I listen to Joe, and man, they don't like each other. And then I listen to Rick, and then I listen to Larry, and then Barry. No, that's not how God is. No, God is simultaneously hearing it all. The Father of all. Simultaneously. We live perpetually in the presence of the Lord. So moments where one is gossiping about the other are moments when God hears both and sees both at the same time. Moment where there's bickering and fighting, God sees both, hears at the same time. Just like little children who fight immediately in the presence of their father. That is what the Christian church uh, does when there is bickering and fighting. The unity is not being maintained. So Paul reminds them, look, you, we have the same father. The same father. That was so tragic for me when I thought about my little brother that day. I thought, oh, what I share with him 
so much more valuable than whatever it was that I was craving in that moment. He's my little brother. <laughs> much more important union that we have than any trivial preference or temptation I had right then. Paul says every brother and sister in Christ shares the same father. Think right now, if you would, about the Christian that it is hardest for you to love. They share the same father with you. Maybe it's a Christian that's disappointed you. Maybe it's a Christian that's perpetually falling short in your mind or really let you down or disillusioned you in some way or didn't live up to what they called other people to live up to or who is it? Who could it be? That Christian shares the same father. That should define us towards them much more than their current sin. Much more than their current sin. They share the same father. You see what Paul's doing? I mean, isn't Paul such a brilliant pastor? I mean, here he is. He's writing this letter to the Ephesians. He's got to fit it all into six chapters. You know, he can't send a book on the shoulder of some poor guy on a donkey all the way to Ephesus. So he, he just, okay, how can, we, how can we back this in? Let me give you just some seven facets, okay? Let me just, you know, body, the spirit, you share the same hope, the same Lord, the share the same faith, the same baptism, the Father over all, through all, in all. Remember, remember, all of that you share the same. It's the same, okay? It's the same that you share. And the most important things, I, I hope he would say, I hope these are the most important things to you. They are objectively the most important things to you. And you share them with every other Christian. Let that motivate you. When it's really hard to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of the peace, re remember these things and you begin to feel, oh yeah, right, what am, I, what am I worried about? I read this week about the, the, the biggest white diamond in the world. I think it's the Kalinin, Kalinin, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, the Kalinin, the diamond. Um, it, it is something like 500 carats and it sits in the scepter uh, that's one of the crown jewels of the Queen of England. So it kind of is there, okay? And it sits there. And I, I was reading about that diamond this week, and I thought, you know, <laughs> first of all, it's a really big diamond. It's a big diamond. I have no idea what it's worth. I mean, could you even calculate the worth of a diamond like that? Really massive diamond. And I thought, you know, it's, 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 it, it's so true what Paul says about unity that it can never be actually devalued you notice he doesn't say, you could have. You have. This is true of you. You have this diamond. God, the Trinity, has done these things, and he's done them towards every Christian the exact same way. So it's this unchangeable, unbreakable truth, this diamond, and you share it in common with every other Christian. You can't de actually devalue the diamond, but of course you could, you could devalue it in, in, your, in your experience. You could choose to use the diamond for a doorstop or a paperweight. You could choose to use it, I suppose, uh, for a baseball out in the street, or maybe as a way of dropping down the drain to see how low it goes. No, you could use it that way. It doesn't actually devalue the diamond. The unity that Christians share is unchangeable and permanently priceless, but it can be functionally devalued in the life of the Christian. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, have we been using the diamond of our unity like a doorstop? Something to be assumed. I'm sure it gets something done, but it's not placed in a central place of worth and honor and emphasis. Let me give you a couple of applications regarding treasuring the unity that we have been given in the Lord. First of all, this passage destroys uh, any concept of false unity. Unity around a false doctrine. I, I think it was John Stott that said uh, 11 men um, are, are, are no more unified uh, in, uh, if they go to a religious meeting than 11 men are a football team that are dead. He said 11 men don't make a football team if they're dead. 11 people attending the same meeting are not uh, unified just because they're in the same meeting. 
they're, they're not they're, they're not experiencing Christian unity. They're experiencing some kind of togetherness, but it's not the Christian togetherness that Paul's talking about here. So what Paul does in describing these doctrines is he's he's clarifying this isn't just any kind of togetherness. This is a togetherness in God, who is the Trinity. There's a certain kind of unity, I guess, at a football game or a sewing club, but that's not the kind of unity that is displaying the Trinity's power that Paul's talking about here. You display a supernatural unity, a unity that transcends natural preferences and boundaries and culture and ethnicities. You, you, you display that. Not the kind of unity that any human being can create. You, you display a unity that God and God alone can create. So this destroys false unity, even if it's of a religious variety. It also is an alternative to flimsy unity, and I think this is the greater temptation for a church like ours. Flimsy unity, unity that's based on similarities of culture, similarities of life preference, similarities of lifestyle, similarities of, of life economy scale, similarities of the way we prefer to relate to one another, a kind of a flimsy unity. Trust me, flimsy unity will not resist the fragmenting forces empowered by sin. They won't resist it. If our unity is built mostly on the fact that we give and receive a certain kind of niceness towards one another, that kind of unity will not resist the fragmenting forces that come as a result of sin. We would much rather, wouldn't you, we would much rather have a small church that is built on true unity than a gigantic church that is built on the flimsy unity of preference. It's harder to fight for, but it's more enduring and lasting and actually brings glory to God. Nothing wrong with a large church as long as it's built on true unity. Nothing wrong with a small church if it's built on true unity. Finally, devalued unity. I think this is a temptation as well. Devalued unity. This is the taking of that diamond and treating it like a doorstop. I, I think here we have to feel the power of what Paul is saying. Sometimes we value convenience over unity. Sometimes we, we value reputation over unity. That's what Paul says to the Corinthians. Wouldn't it be better to be wronged than to display disunity for your own personal rights? That's the whole logic of his point. Wouldn't it be better to be wronged? That's based on the assumption that the display of God's wisdom to the universe is much more important to a Christian than the upholding of my individual rights. Wouldn't it be better to sacrifice my rights in order to uphold the most more important treasure of our unity? That's what he's saying. But I think we, we need this exhortation because we can devalue unity. We can devalue it. We can count it as being less valuable. This happens in marriages. It's more important to me that my spouse would stop this ridiculous habit than the fact that I am one with them in Christ. It happens with brothers and sisters in the church. It is more important to me that they acknowledge what they have done as wrong, that I am one with them in Christ. It's more important to me that they grow faster then I am one with them in Christ. We, we sort of devalue unity, don't we? And, and, and unity is not this, it doesn't eliminate the need for growth and conflict resolution. Uh, all the caveats are there, right? But we need to elevate this, this incredible treasure that we have. We've been made one in the most important things about us. My actions don't untie the unity I have with my brother or sister in Christ. But they do discard it. They may trade it in for a, a trinket of selfish preference or personal vindication or convenience. They should be displayed 
as in a scepter of the monarch. That should be our heart as we think about this passage. Display what you have done, Lord. As I forgive, as I love, as I endure, as I am patient, as I overlook, as I serve with this person who doesn't serve me, as I love the unlovely or the unloving, help me so that you can display your scepter of your power creating the unity in the church that only you could create. Display it, Lord. It's more important. It's more important than my preference. It's more important than my rights. It's more important than my desires. It's more important than my vindication. It's more important, Lord, so that you receive the glory because that's how Paul ended chapter three. To him be the glory. And isn't it interesting that he immediately moves into the unity of the church? To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Throughout all generations, maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. One Spirit, one body, one baptism, one Lord, one faith, one Father, over all, through all, in all. Glorify yourself, Lord, through the display of the unity of your church, which you have created for the sake of your name. The good news about devaluing the most important things is that one of those things is the Savior. <laughs> the, the Christian gospel, it, it solves even the issues that convict us about our lack of valuing it. So we're convicted of, of devaluing the most important things. We confess it, and the Lord raises them in importance again. It's a marvelous gospel. So if you're convicted of devaluing unity with your spouse or with your child or with a brother and sister in Christ, you can come to the same cross again and confess those things, receive forgiveness, which they're also simultaneously receiving, and enjoy the unity that you have with them again. Marvelous, marvelous gospel truth. So if you are convicted, go to the cross again. Same cross, same faith. Remember your baptism. I was once dead, I've been made alive into forgiveness and no condemnation. And now I can fight for the unity that God has given us for the glory of his name. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for these treasures that you have given us. That you've given all of us the same. Lord, we thank you, Lord, and, and we pray for their application in our church, that we would fulfill this display of your glory, that we would maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Lord, when inevitable conflicts come, inevitable temptations, that you would drive us back to the most precious truths that we have. Take us back to the cross. Lord, with our spouses and our children and our, our friends and our co-laborers, take us back to the cross. Let that inform us, Lord. Let it amaze us. Let it inspire us. Let it show us your greatness. Turn it on in our heart, Lord, and draw us to yourself. And in that same way, draw us to each other. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.